Hello, everyone. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, How to Efficiently Detect, Identify, and Locate RF Interference to Increase RAN Capacity and Data Throughputs, presented by Viavi. Our presenter today is Brad Getzelman, Wireless Applications Test Engineer at Viavi. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Brad. Thank you, Kyle. Um, greatly appreciate it. Uh, as we basically uh, get started, I do have a, a quick poll I'd like to uh, share with the uh, audience and the participants. Um, basically, what I'm looking for is to try to understand from the methods below, how do you detect interference? Um, do you use in user experience for the complaint of block calls, drop calls, poor audio quality, or data throughputs? Um, you can also record this using drive tests where you automate application layer tests. Um, so if you would, Kyle, please bring up the uh, poll and I'll continue to kind of describe each one of these items. But again, I'd like to see this more or less as a multiple choice um, or that you can check as many as you'd like. Okay, I'm not seeing on this end, but uh, basically in terms of uh, analysis of OS systems, uh, basically it's from taking a centralized view using key field extractions to detect path imbalances or even remote control of transmitters to measure impact on received levels. Uh, Built-in NEM alarms, this can oftentimes be set using uh, thresholds with remote radios to report uh, received diversity alarms, Viswar elevated uh, uplink noise levels, um, or spectrum analysis, where does the spectrum details actually look healthy, or signal analysis, do all aspects of the signal look healthy? Um, as you share your experience, uh, the efficiency of detection is based on resources you have available, obviously. Um, so to detect, identify, and isolate faults, it's ultimately best served by the fact of what I refer to in my years of experience as testability. Uh, these include access, visibility, control of the segments being tested. So uh, that's kind of the uh, theme I'll be using throughout the uh, presentation. And uh, Kyle, if you think we've had enough uh, response, uh, go ahead and present those uh, results. I think people might be interested in just uh, what methods and otherwise are being used for uh, detecting uh, interference. To efficiently detect 100% of the interference, you really should be using all of the above. Uh, each one of them has their own advantages and can actually lead to uh, detecting and isolating a wide variety of different types of uh, interference. So uh, thank you very much for the response. But again, we're going to try to help you understand why I think all of these items otherwise can be a benefit. To first talk about interference, we really need to talk about the four sources as well as well sources as well as susceptibility. Uh, you have emissions that are uh, conducted and radiated plus conducted and radiated susceptibility. Uh, those are the four basic components that otherwise are considered part of interference. In the world of RF, we intentionally radiate and receive signals across open air, thus they have a wide variety of potential sources of interference. Unwanted emissions can originate from electronic devices producing RF, example, laptops, power supplies, projectors, TVs, etc or noisy electrical devices, example, power supplies, grounds, et cetera, or environments like lightning and static. All these can all be sources of interference. Both good as well as unwanted signals have physical objects that they can also encounter as part of interference because it impedes the signals. For example, one solution to poor RF reception is to walk outside or to go to a window, uh, reducing the number and types of physical objects. Uh, but in either case, conducted or radiated, they both have these same elements to deal with. But really, given much of the industry buzz of numerous problems with interference, we suspect you may not have to travel very far to find and fix it, unless, of course, the problem is the top of the tower, meaning that the highest probable cause of RF interference generally starts right there at the cell site. And why do I say that? Because of the usual highest odd suspects, uh, these are the items that otherwise I have seen in my travels talking to uh, customers who work in the wireless industry. Uh, you basically have to consider the number and proximity of the high power sources. Now, the pie chart that's shown at the bottom is just an example of some of the PEM items uh, that we oftentimes hear from uh, customers as far as problems they're experiencing that are otherwise self-inflicted. So it comes down to the components and the installation quality can affect, you know, uh, PIM, harmonics, various emissions, leakage, all these items are otherwise part of, uh, when we say, items to consider as far as interference that otherwise starts at the site. We even have, believe it or not, quite a bit of 3G, 4G 
uh, systems out there that are still using very poor coverage designs uh, based upon 3G, 4G technologies. Uh, if you have antennas uh, from 2G that have not been uh, uh, down tilted and power levels changed, odds are they're probably not well suited for 3G, 4G coverage. You also have the potential of tower versus roof sites. You know, most cell site designs, they work off of a triangular aspect, meaning that there's generally three sides. But most of us have that wonderful experience of going to the top of a building that allows you easy access to that cell site. Unfortunately, buildings are generally designed in rectangles, which means that when you place antennas on the edges of these roofs, trying to create that triangular pattern, it means that one of two things is generally going to happen. Either antennas are going to be pointing at the backs of other antennas because you have multiple antennas for multiple carriers, or if you try to offset them back away from the edge, trying to create that triangular pattern, you now have the potential of having metal flashing along the edge, which can otherwise introduce them. So these are some of the considerations or some of the highest odd suspects of what I've seen in my travels. Um, the other thing is, as far as interference, most of the interference that I've heard of is actually close to the site. The emitters are actually in very close proximity to the sites themselves. Uh, this is oftentimes very uh, notable by only a single sector may be uh, impacted where the other two sectors are not. That's generally a clear indication that the problem is actually very close by. This next slide tries to explore, what do you say, some of the high level ways of detecting and identifying um, interference and even locating in some cases. As you look at the LTE PRV, the physical resource block tool usage at the top, you'll notice in the upper uh, left hand corner that I'm showing a, uh, let me say, a long duration, I would have to say this is probably over a few days, of uh, spectrum analysis from the network equipment manufacturer's reporting system. Now in this case, I can see on one edge that we may have some adjacent uh, spectrum interference that's encroaching upon that LTE. And there's even one point in time where they actually had a very strong interferer but it doesn't look like it's consistent. So try to find that one. It could be extremely challenging because it's not persistent. Now at the bottom, you'll also notice that we have some SIPRI spectrum analyzer views. One of the key things I want to point out with these SIPRI type of spectrum analyzer views, which comes from RF placed onto a piece of fiber, is that the adjacent spectrum is not real, meaning that the radios, and even some of these PRB reports up here at the top, it's only reporting what's actually within the spectrum of the LTE signal. Even though it looks like it's showing adjacent spectrum, and the reality is, or fact is, that's not actually real spectrum. If I walk the CW tone across, you'd see that it disappears uh, as I get to the edges. Now these other examples are otherwise showing example. These are PIM, these are very common. Now at first it didn't seem like there was much of a problem, but then over time, all of a sudden, you can see that it basically starts showing itself. You may be able to correlate that to when somebody had otherwise visited the site. Now in the upper right hand corner, this is clearly a very serious PIM issue, just like the traces that are otherwise shown at the bottom. It was very easy to see a typical slope, which is oftentimes caused when you have PIM being generated by a single LTE carrier. Uh, once they torqued down the uh, RF connectors, it went away, life is good again. But again, just an example of how much of the interference that's out there actually is being found to be self-inflicted. This is another way of detecting interference. It's based on a path loss imbalance. This is actually taken from our uh, drive test tool from uh, Android handsets, where in our latest release of software, it otherwise shows the differences between the uplink and the downlink uh, path loss. Here we can see that we have the power level of what's coming out of the base station versus what we're receiving it at up here at the top. And then what the uh, base station expects us to transmit back at from our handset to otherwise determine what is the path loss on the uplink. So with this kind of indication, you can otherwise determine do I have problems on either the downlink or on the uplink based upon the differences in those power levels. Well, something to clearly to uh, keep in mind when you're otherwise trying to initially detect whether or not you have an interference issue either on the uplink or the downlink. Probably the most uh, purest and the best way to find a lot of self-inflicted PIM issues is using a real spectrum analyzer and the tap and torque method. Meaning that generally when you have physical uh, issues, whether there be connectors um, or cables or uh, problems, 
uh, generally movement or torquing things down, you will oftentimes see that that tap will actually resonate and actually change the spectrum analyzer display. Now notice this is an actual spectrum analyzer display, so in this case, the adjacent channel spectrum is being shown and will oftentimes when it comes to PIM, clearly be seen when you're looking at a spectrum analyzer. Now there's more points that we'll make with the later slides, uh, but otherwise, other considerations of how to properly use a spectrum analyzer, but I wanted to start out with this is one of the most common and the one of the most practical ways of detecting and isolating where that PIM might be uh, originating from. When you do find that you have a PIM issue, um, unfortunately, the isolation methods come by way of dissection, inspection, and or range to PIM, distance to PIM, PIM test equipment. Now, measurements are very impressive from uh, PIM testers. Unfortunately, they're intrusive. You do have to break open connections. They're meant for specific bands. They're oftentimes costly because you have to have one for each band. They're best when you're used in a production environment, to be honest with you, and an initial site installation. Um, they're also relatively heavy to hoist to the top of the tower and even time consuming to uh, employ the services. But if they're used properly, they can be extremely useful to pinpoint the sources of that PIM. Now there are alternatives to detecting PIM. That is to turn on AILG and OCNS transmitter test modes. This is air interface load generation and orthogonal code or channel noise simulation uh, while using a spectrum analyzer. And again, if you have a good uh, view or vantage point of the spectrum while you're turning off these transmitters, if your own transmitters are causing interference to receive, oftentimes it can be clearly seen just simply by knowing how to properly use a spectrum analyzer. But in ideal cases, you need to either have RF and or fiber test points. Uh, that, again, ideally they're permanently installed so this method is not intrusive and requires very little setup. You can even introduce a uh, PIM rated load to verify a problem. Uh, by dissecting at a key points, uh, you can basically regenerate that signal and see whether or not the uh, PIM issue has been resolved by using a PIM rated load at that particular junction. Um, unfortunately, you may never be 100% PIM free over time because, for example, lightning arresters do lose their PIM ratings uh, based on usage, and you're also at the risk of metallic corrosion and connectors getting loosened. Uh, one of the most uh, novel what do you say, pointed uh, facts that somebody pointed out is electrical tape on an RF connector. If you think about it, there's actually four different ways that you can apply electrical tape to an electrical connector. But of those four different methods, only one of them is optimal. That is, you want to start with the tape at the bottom and work up so that you're shedding water as the water runs down a cable. So that's pretty obvious, very similar to shingles on top of a roof. But the other one was not quite so obvious, but very pointed is that you want to take the electrical tape and go counterclockwise. The reason for that is when you stretch that electrical tape and you go counterclockwise, it's going to act like a spring trying to move that connector. Well, if the connector is being tightened, it's a good thing. But if you wrap the tape in a clockwise fashion, odds are the tape is actually going to be working to loosen that RF connection. So think about the details. It can be actually a very uh, beneficial uh, aspect of preventing some of the problems that are oftentimes seen. We've also seen in our travel far too much dirty fiber. Uh, when you basically have dirty fiber, this is going to interfere with the RF that's going over the fiber. And unfortunately, it's way too common. Um, I personally will not touch anybody's fiber unless I have a fiber microscope, the appropriate fiber adapter tip, and a fiber cleaning kit. Um, imagine the damage you can cause by mating dirty polished fiber connections. Uh, I never want to be that person, uh, otherwise that could be considered one of the suspects for damaging someone's fiber, especially if it's a fiber that's inside of a hybrid cable running out the top of the tower. That's an extremely expensive cable and the labor to replace it is not going to be cheap. So take your time, make sure that your fibers are clean or at least determine the uh, quality of the workmanship that preceded you. So basically what it comes down to is knows your setup, the quality of it, and also the coverage of your RF, meaning that you want to have clean and tight wires and fibers. You want to have clear dynamic range between idle and full power. What I'm referring to here is that when it comes to test and measurement, performance is a key 
threshold where you decide to pass and fail things. But you have to understand dynamic range, whether it be of the base station, or more importantly, even your test equipment, because you can produce bad test results by improper setup of the equipment. But the other aspect, which I've seen far too often, is that ultimately, when it comes to interference, you have to realize that in 3G, 4G technologies, a lot of the interference out there is actually self-inflicted. In order to minimize that, you need to minimize the coverage overlap in areas where you have dense usage, where people tend to congregate, that's not the area where you want multiple sites overlapping with each other. It's just simply, that's, that's the way it works. Now, as I go into the next few slides, we really need to understand the units of power. We use a scale of dB. dB is, in fact, a ratio. The letter M says we actually have a reference point, and that reference point is one milliwatt. So as you look at this scale, I want you to realize that, example, a change in uh, uh, watts that may be a multiplier of 10 or 2, that is a plus when you're in the dB world. If you're dividing that power in watts, whether it be divided by 10 or divided by 2, you're now going to subtract from that scale in dB. So these are basically the basic factors that have to be clearly understood when you're otherwise trying to evaluate interference, because it's this scale which ultimately is going to drive your conclusions of is this good or is it bad. The next slide, let me say, I've seen this equation numerous times, but I'll be honest with you, it wasn't until about four years ago I ultimately came to realize just how important this slide is. Now, part of my, when I say resistance to memorizing or wanting to commit this to, when I say memory, is it's got an equation, it's got some really large numbers, you know, temperature and Kelvin, these are things that I don't generally deal with. But after I looked at it a little bit longer, I came to realize Boltzmann's constant is exactly that. It is a constant. It doesn't change. When I'm talking about temperature and I think about Kelvin, it's a very large scale, 273 plus temperature centigrade. And I actually put through this equation a change in temperature of plus or minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The change in dB was less than plus or minus 1 dB. And given most environments I'm working in a room temperature, for all intent purposes, I can kind of approximate and say, I don't really care so much about the temperature either, because it's pretty consistent. But the bandwidth is clearly, and this looks at that scale, if you increase the bandwidth by two, you have a 3 dB addition. So the amount of power that you're measuring is going to increase by 3 dB. Or 3 dB. If you go up to 100 kilohertz, you have to move the decimal place five places. That's a 50 dB change. So we went from neg 174 to minus 124. These are the theoretical starting points that must be understood when you're evaluating 3G and 4G technologies. Because the expectation is, you should be having power levels, depending upon your bandwidth, that hover or is just above these levels, especially at their destinations on the uplink. So keep this in mind as we go through our next few slides. When it comes to detecting interference and using a spectrum analyzer, this slide is probably one of the best ways of understanding all of the components that go into spectrum analysis. The beauty of a piece of test equipment is the dynamic range can be extended. To extend that dynamic range is because the equipment has built-in attenuation. So, first understand whether or not your equipment is using internal attenuation. Now, you can also use external attenuation because obviously you don't want to damage your test equipment. But the beauty of internal attenuation is it automatically adjusts scales. And we'll talk more about that later because you can also get false results from a spectrum analyzer if you overdraw it drive it, and we're going to talk about attenuation and how we're going to use that to verify if the signal is real or if it's in fact being generated by the spectrum analyzer. Preamp. This is the single best way of increasing the dynamic range on the low end of the scale, trying to look at signals coming across an antenna. The preamp is going to drop that noise floor and actually give you visibility into the weaker signals. But I also encourage that you add min and max traces. These are going to show you details that are captured and retained to help you clearly see whether or not you have an underlying problem 
or if a major problem exists, it may only be temporary. But the trade-offs ultimately come down to the frequency span and the resolution bandwidth. Ideally, we want to dial down our resolution bandwidth, and we'll talk more about that in further slides, so that we can see more and more of the details, as can be seen by the slide in the lower uh, uh, right-hand side, off, just off the center. As you lower that, you ultimately get to see more. Here's what we're actually seeing on the spectrum, where they went from a 300 kilohertz uh, resolution bandwidth, and you're not seeing any type of interference, down to a resolution bandwidth of 10 kilohertz, where all of a sudden you start seeing signatures that are not supposed to be there, or if they are, you really weren't able to see them before. Now, in this case, these are probably GSM channels, and I've seen a lot of it. In fact, you can even see a GSM channel that was placed in between two uh, UMTS carriers. Again, this can be practical if all the signal strengths are the same. Unfortunately, I've seen an instance where they installed a DAS system that only supported UMTS and LTE. The people who were going into the stadium had otherwise, the people setting up the uh, floor basically had forced their handsets to GSM, meaning that when they went inside the building, their handsets are literally screaming to get out to a GSM macro site outside the uh, uh, convention center, and it's actually preventing the UMTS and LTE that's adjacent to it from actually working. So be careful when you're placing signals next to each other. They can cause unexpected problems. This next slide is otherwise, again, drawing attention to using a max hold and a min hold trace. In this case, the min hold trace looks very clean. On the max hold, we can clearly see by looking at the bandwidth of the signal that that is, in fact, a uh, GSM signal that may not always be present because, again, GSM is a time division type of technology. So using a max hold makes these items and that signature visible. So bear that in mind when you use the spectrum analyzer. I'm definitely a big fan of always having all three traces visible to me. This next one gets into the time division. Whether it be WiMAX or LTE TDD, sometimes when you want to look at spectrum, you actually need to set it up as a gated sweep, which means that there's a specific point in time that you want to look at the spectrum, generally when you're not transmitting power. Because on the uplink, when you're trying to see that spectrum, in this case, you can actually see using a gated sweep that in fact, they could see multiple interferers that are otherwise present. If you were looking at just a straight spectrum analyzer without that gated sweep, creating that small opportunity of uh, visibility in between transmits, you would not have otherwise very likely seen that interference. So knowing how to use that feature can be extremely beneficial when you're trying to find interference on a shared channel between uplink and downlink. This next slide basically says that there's also a benefit when you see potential interference and you're trying to gain the identity of that interference. This is where signal analysis, where you actually take the specific technology and you demodulate it, it will give you the details needed to understand where is that signal coming from. Uh, whatever service provider that may be uh, causing it, whether it be yourself or somebody else, if you're on an area where you have a border uh, with another service provider, signal analysis is one of the single best ways of identifying the details so that when you communicate to your neighbor that you've got a problem, you're providing the level of detail that it's hard to uh, argue that, in fact, yes, that's where that site's at, and it is basically overlapping or exceeding its intended coverage area. So signal analysis is a great way of identifying that you have interference from other technologies or neighboring technologies. The bottom line is, anytime you're using a spectrum analyzer, you need to know what the time period and what the frequency is. Um, also, most defaults are for average power or RMS type of power. Be careful of that. Um, if you've got an intermittent interferer, uh, oftentimes that intermittent interference will get averaged into a normal signal, which means that it's not very visible. One of the single best ways of increasing your visibility is to look for peak power. We'll talk about it a little bit more by using the detector on the trace settings so that you can actually see the highest value over some period of time. But the bottom line is, if anybody ever gives you a 
dBm value, if they've not conveyed what the bandwidth is, that power level is pretty much meaningless. Now, the one exception to that is a CW. A sine wave or carrier wave has no modulation. So whatever the peak is in dBm, congratulations. I don't need to know the uh, width. It's a sine wave. It doesn't occupy any width. There's no modulation. So that's the one exception as far as how power levels will change based upon bandwidths. Now let's talk a little bit more specifically relative to common signals. If you use Boltzmann's constant and you use or look or consider the bandwidth of each one of these technologies, LTE has uh, physical resource blocks and they're actually 180 kilohertz wide. Well, they're really, really close in size to a GSM uh, channel, which is basically 200 kilohertz wide. Well, if you use that Boltzmann's constant, 100 kilohertz, that took you to a minus 124 dBm. Well, to get to 200, you had to double that, so that's another 3 dB. So it effectively puts both of these, as far as noise power, the baseline starting point is a neg 121. You don't operate below it, and you should be operating, especially on LTE, uh, CDMA, and UMTS technologies, you should be operating just above that technology. Because in each one of those cases, notice the little uh, note here that basically shows that GSM is not like the others. That's because all the other three technologies have a frequency reuse of one. So with that in mind, you need to realize that all three of those technologies are trying to operate very close to that noise floor. GSM, you can have a lot of overlap between different GSM channels. There are different frequencies. They're not competing with each other. That's not the case with 3G, 4G technologies. But ultimately, what we're also trying to show is basically in terms of when you're looking for where should I be in the ballpark as far as approximate, you can generally add another 3 dB of noise to that Boltzmann's constant uh, for the various bandwidths to get you real close to where you think you, or you should be when you're measuring spectrum and you're considering each one of the individual technologies. This one is one that I hold quite dearly as far as a slide. Uh, it clearly conveys, if you look at these little diamonds here, these diamonds are basically showing you that when you have a single sector, notice the high elevation for each one of these diamonds, and it's not competing with any other sectors, you generally get very good sinar values. But as you look at each one of these groups of three, as you have a second sector within 5 dB, of the dominant, you immediately see that it is impacting the sinar value. Impact of the sinar value means that you're not going to get the higher modulation rates. So again, the best possible coverage for 3G and 4G technology, because it's a frequency reuse of one, is to try to minimize the overlap between adjacent sites and sectors. So bear that in mind, because in terms of interference, I have seen a lot of this in my travels where I see far more sectors trying to serve me than what I would expect to see for that area. Now, if it's in the middle of a cow field or corn field, we don't really care. If it's where people congregate, you've got a problem for both capacity as well as throughput. In our travels, conducted susceptibility. Needless to say, in the most simple understanding of DAS systems, uh, besides where you place the antennas and that they not compete with each other or the macro site, the only other purpose that a DAS serves is to get a signal from point A to point B and in the reverse from B back to A without distorting that signal, or interfering with that quality of that signal. In this case, we've actually seen on some branches of a DAS system where the signal that comes into it is quite clean and you're using signal analysis to verify that, yeah, it's a really clean transmit signal going into the DAS system, it may not also necessarily be maintained at the other end. So when it comes to interference, keep in mind that the output of a DAS system is supposed to maintain that signal quality. Otherwise, it's interfering with the quality of the signal. But the best use of this is to have non-intrusive test points at key demarcation points, meaning who's responsible for the signal up to that point, and can I not intrusively plug into it and verify the quality. This slide is to otherwise convey that practical understanding of what happens when a reference signal comes down 
The handset is calculating a CQI, that's a channel quality indicator, to otherwise convey back to the scheduler which of these three modulations is going to work best. Now, as you get closer to the site within that area of pilot dominance, you should be able to ideally use 64 qualm. The constellation could be tight because the signal quality is really good. As you start to get away from that site and you get into the overlap, then you have to start using more robust modulation schemes in order to be successful. In LTE, it's actually a preemptive technology where it actually wants to get it right the first time. Now, I want to forewarn you, we're hearing rumblings that they're actually talking about trying to actually implement 256 QAM over the air. That means that your RF planning and your coverage, you need to be very clear on where exactly the overlap is and where people congregate because we'd all love to have 256 QAM, but it's only if RF conditions are nearly as good as a hardwired connection. Keep that in mind because in terms of RF interference, this is where it begins within 3G, 4G technologies because it can prevent you from otherwise having a successful uh, throughput or capacity. Now, if it's not part of your system and you're otherwise now looking to chase it down because you've done everything you can to maintain the best signal quality, your grounding is good, your antenna placement's good, you got no PIM, you got no other issues, now you have to chase it down because there are external sources of interference. But the five rules that I want you to live by is if the receiver can't see it, it's not interference. You'll find lots of sources as you drive around that are otherwise within the spectrum of interest. But if it's not strong enough, it's not important. Always use a passband filter for uplink. You know, somebody put the, or use the expression, it's kind of like trying to look at the stars when the sun is out. The front end of the test instrument can be easily overdriven by the downlink power. And when you're trying to chase down a low powered emitter close to the cell site, you need a bandpass filter to attenuate that transmit power. Otherwise, you don't stand a chance of finding that uplink interfere. Gain is extremely important. You're going to find that in later slides. We're going to talk about it more in detail. Dano, displayed average noise level is important. And this is where you have to familiarize yourself with your test equipment, your setup, and your settings. But then ultimately, you also need to calculate the path loss. And each one of these will cover in more details. Rule one, does the receiver see it? There's basically lots of examples. One is a cable TV. They knew at a base station, they could see by the spectrum the signature of a cable TV being the interferer. But as they looked around the site, there were no homes, no businesses. So they start driving into the neighborhood, looking for cable TV interference. And what do you think? They found some. But when they started doing path loss calculations, they came to realize none of these signals were actually strong enough to make it back to the receive to be impacting the receiver. So they went back to that empty lot next to the uh, base station. And they decided to get out of the vehicle and start walking that empty lot. They came to find out there had been a building there previously that gotten demolished. And there was actually a cable coax that was buried just underneath the surface of the dirt that was actually that source of interference. So never underestimate where the interference can come from. The second example is one that plagued a market for many, many months, if I'm not over a year. On hot summer days, that's when they would otherwise get their alarms from their system that they had an elevated noise floor. They thought, you know, it was next to a music park, you know, maybe it's a music park. Well, it wasn't consistent enough when the park was open, when the rides were open. Um, but it was only on sunny days and it was nice and hot out. So I thought, well, maybe something's, you know, shining down on a box, making it hot. Ultimately, what they came to find out, it was a boat. This boat had apparently been struck by lightning. The insurance companies replaced everything electrical on the boat, except for at the top of the mast, there was an amplifier. It was damaged from that lightning strike. And every time the person went out on the boat, they were actually causing interference to their cell site. So bright sunny days actually correspond with somebody using the boat that had a, a bad uh, amplifier. The key to efficiently finding problems is having access. That is the first of the three rules of testability. If you can't access it, you really, it's not testable. So ideally you want hardwired connection. Alcatel-Lucent on their TRDUs provided not only receive test points to look at 
your seed power after the bandpass filters, but they also provided transmit test points. So you could look for the signal quality at 40 dB down from the actual outputs of the uh, transmitters. On other equipment manufacturers, to do this, you have to add external couplers. These are low-loss pass-through couplers, which are great for otherwise testing signal quality coming out of the transmitters. In the area where you have RF now on fiber, we highly encourage you to have an optical coupler where the fiber from the remote radio head and the baseband unit pass through this coupler, giving you a very simple, non-intrusive, you don't have to disrupt service to otherwise look at the RF quality simply by using a single patch cord. Plug it into the coupler, plug it into the test equipment, You've not impacted any customers or any service, and you've now gained not only access, but visibility into what's going on across that fiber link. Rule two, use a bandpass filter for uplink. Uh, here I'm actually showing a broadband magnetic mount um, and a bandpass filter. Again, if you have a strong signal that can create false signals when you overload the spectrum analyzer. The filters can help prevent most of those. Um, but using the analyzer's built-in attenuator, you can actually use that to validate external interference. I have a slide to otherwise show that and what you need to do. That's this one here. Overloading the analyzer. Notice when I have two carriers. If you're overloading the spectrum analyzer, it will produce third-order intermod, as well as fifth, seventh, all the way down the line. So be careful with the spectrum analyzer that you don't have unwanted signals being created internally and having it displayed right along with the external signals. So don't ch waste your time chasing these. The best way to verify them or to validate them is to use the built-in attenuation. And here for external signals, if you place a marker on an external signal and you increase the uh, attenuation internally, the signal strength will remain the same at minus 50 dBm. If it's internally generated, you will see a nonlinearity, meaning that as I change my internal attenuation by 5 dB, you'll see a much bigger difference in the change of the amplitude on the screen, and it doesn't actually you know, correspond to the original value that you saw without the attenuation. This is the single best way to validate whether or not you have, when you say, ghost images on your spectrum analyzer that's not real from the outside world, they're actually produced inside the instrument. When we talk about gain, it's important. For each 60 dB of gain, you double the distance from which you can see the interfere. So if you were able to add 60 dB of gain, you're able to, instead of seeing 100 meters out, you can now see 200 meters out. So keep this in mind as you're choosing your antennas or as you're making your settings on your uh, instrument, to increase the amount of rain, what you can see, 6 dB makes a big difference. You'll see this in other slides as we otherwise do path loss. Let's now talk about dano. As you use narrow resolution bandwidth settings, you can push down the noise floor. Again, for every 6 dB, you double your sight distance, and generally you can reduce your try time by as much as four, a factor of four. Also keep in mind that you can, most of today's spectrum analyzers actually have an FFT, fast Fourier transform, sweep speeds can oftentimes be increased by a factor of 10. So if you're using it in normal mode, you may want to change that mode over to fast using FFT so you get much faster sweeps. Faster sweeps can be beneficial, but to me, oftentimes they're more entertaining. Um, I would much rather use resolution bandwidth, and also we're going to talk about peak detection, because really that's the way I want to look for my spectrum. Um, but also, what I'm also getting to here is set your reference levels and scale for division to gain perspective. To me, when I look at a spectrogram when it's only two colors, it's like looking at a black and white TV. If you simply move these strong signals to the top using the reference level and then lowering your scale for division, you can actually get the full color of the rainbow and you'll see a lot more details in way of your spectrum. Path loss estimates. Path loss can help you determine the interference impact in the site. Please don't chase the signals if the BTS doesn't see it. In order to understand path loss, you need to understand the noise level of your receiver. It's based upon your preamp, your attenuation, and resolution bandwidth. You need to estimate the interference transmit power. Then estimate the interference power at the base station. 
use a path loss table to make the estimate. Let me give a couple of examples. First, we'll give you the equation for path loss. There's a few different uh, variations, but they effectively all produce the same thing. Here we're using a frequency of 751 megahertz. And you can see that basically the initial uh, distance here at 1 dB, or excuse me, 1 meter, is about a 30 dB path loss. As you move down that scale, and you go to 100 meters, you're at 70 dB, 200 meters, 76, you'll see that as you keep doubling the distance, you're actually going about a 6 dB change. So with path loss, again, that 6 dB of extra gain, you can effectively double the visible area because you can see twice as far. Here's the examples I wanted to share. Here's a simplified example of path loss. An LT channel is impacted by an interferer at MEG 118 dBm or higher. That's actually, you know, where we otherwise consider that there's a problem um, because that neg 118 is what we basically took from from Boltzmann's constant, added 3 dB to it. So the BTS above, a neg 128 dBm, a 10 dB fudge factor, will be addressed, meaning that we've got some tolerances here that we need to work with. So using the example of 1900 megahertz, you basically take from this column, 1900 megahertz, distance interferes, so we're going to be looking at the 68, as well as 500 meters from the BTS. That's going to be down here at this 92. And these two values, neg plus 68 and minus 92, when you start out with that neg 110 measured at 100 kilohertz, add 68 because you're getting closer to the source. That's the actual source signal strength. Then as you move away from the source, you're going down neg 92 because you're going away from the uh, actual source. So now you're at a minus 134 when it hits the antenna. You have 18 dB of gain. You now add that back. You're now actually seeing a neg 116 dBm at the base station. That's going to be a problem. All right, on the practical side, as you're setting up a spectrum analyzer, remember antenna gain at 10 dB is significant. Please don't go out a mile out if only seen on one sector. An omni antenna on top of the car is the best starting point. Anybody who has trouble shot or look for interference that start out with a directional antenna will tell you how quickly they become disenchanted because they find multi-path. They don't actually find the source. If you have high elevation, top of a building, top of a hill, you might want to start out with a directional antenna if you've got the proper gain and you can see that far away. Otherwise, most people with experience say, start with an Omni on top of the vehicle. An ideal sweep time, I generally like three times per second. But here are some of the settings that you need to use when you're using your spectrum analyzer to be practical to find interference. You want three traces, a clear right that constantly shows you what's the latest and greatest. Min hold and max hold. Let's capture. Is there anything lurking underneath or is there anything that otherwise popped up that otherwise looks unusual or unhealthy? Preamp. Again, lowering that dynamic range. Reference level. Let's move the strong signals to the top, dB per division. Let's move the weak signals to the bottom. So when I'm looking at a spectrogram, I get the full color of the rainbow. But one of the key points here is the peak detector please make sure that you take the time to turn that on, on your traces, because if you've got spurious emissions, I will guarantee you, I would much rather have peak detection than a fast spectrum analyzer. Some fast, fast spectrum analyzers won't actually allow you to adjust the resolution bandwidth down far enough to look far enough down. I like instruments that do, and when I turn on peak detector, I don't have to worry about as fast of a sweep because I now have the ability to capture all of the peaks. They don't get averaged in to a RMS or average trace. Pre-selector bandpass filters, they help with that dynamic range, but bottom line, persistence and patience when hunting. To summarize what we've presented, much of the interference is at or very close to the site, either low quality components or poor workmanship, the poor plumbing, uh, RF and fiber hygiene, not good. I've seen a lot of those uh, instances. Grounding, antenna placements, not aware of the surroundings, what's in front of it, triangles versus squares. RF planning still using 2G coverage patterns that were never optimized for 3G and 4G coverage. I've actually had engineers tell me that, yeah, when they deployed 3G, they said, no, 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 no. we're not going to do anything to our uh, uh, existing antennas. So the only opportunity they had to down tilt was when they started deploying new carriers. Um, low power emitters close by. These can be a major source of problem. Um, and generally, 
the most prevalent. If it's not at the site, more than likely it's a low power emitter that's close to the site. Only look for what is affecting the receivers. Don't look for something caused by overdriving the instrument. And do yourself a favor, don't call a tower climber unless you can consistently replicate the problem. That really comes to the next point. Can you control your transmitter output? That's probably the single best way of otherwise being able to detect that you've got a problem that is otherwise self-inflicted. Be methodical, persistent, and patient when you're isolating the problem. And at all costs, avoid adding more problems to the process. If you start disconnecting connectors to try to find a problem, uh, you may actually be introducing new ones. So please be careful uh, as you're otherwise looking for interference. Um, again, we understand that there's many, many challenges, uh, but we're trying to share with you some of the basics that you need to understand when you're trying to otherwise hunt down interference. So with that, I'd basically like to ask, are there any questions? All right, thanks, Brad. This is Kyle again. Um, that was a great presentation. We've had a lot of great uh, questions come in, actually, so let's go ahead and get started. If anyone has any questions, please submit them via the Q&A tab. So first question, Brad, what do you mean by good, varied, and bad test setups? What happens is, is that if you know how to properly use your test equipment, uh, you can see very well exactly what's going on with the site. But not all test setups, um, they're varied. Uh, I've seen a variety of them, and I've even seen them to the point where they're a bad test setup. Uh, signal quality looks bad, but in fact, they're overdriving the instrument. They didn't add enough attenuation on the front end or an internal of the instrument. So be careful. There's a lot of, when it comes to dynamic range, there's a lot of room in the middle to have less than optimal setups of test equipment. Okay, great. So the next question we had come in is, is poor SINR a good indication of the presence of interference? Um, poor SINR, yeah. Um, SINR is oftentimes an indication of exactly what's happening with the uh, uh, signal quality, and it will ultimately decide what type of uh, interference is actually out there and present. Uh, so SINAR is an excellent um, indication of signal quality, both for in-band as well as out-of-band you know, signals, meaning your own signals versus uh, those of others. Um, when I'm doing a hardwired connection, uh, SINAR values for LTE often approach the high scale of 40. And even over the air, if I'm using a directional antenna standing underneath uh, in the sweet spot, I generally should be able to get into the 30s or at least into the high 28s, uh, in the high 20s. So SINAR is a very indication, very good indication of what type of uh, throughput you're going to get. All right, thanks. Next question we had come in. How does one identify in-band and out-band emissions and protect them? Um, the in-band and out-of-band. Um, your best way of seeing uh, the out of band, which is encroaching into yours, is with the real spectrum analyzer, where you can actually see the adjacent and the guard bands. Uh, because if it's on the edge, odds are it's also uh, encroaching on your spectrum. Um, in band spectrum uh, interference, this is where you're typically looking for a healthy trace on your spectrum analyzer. And I highly encourage you to spend or invest a considerable amount of time looking at known good signals. Uh, these are signatures that you would like to see repeated throughout your network. But when you have an area that's in question, um, the in-band interference, um, oftentimes either through your min-hold or your max-hold, it's not going to look normal. Um, so look for those, and especially you know, on that peak detector, have that turned on so you can otherwise capture those, when you say, unexpected uh, uh, interferers. Okay, great. So the next question we had come in, with a spectrum analyzer, how can you isolate uh, by measuring from a sniffer port inside the cabinet if the elevated noise is caused by external interference or by internal PIM? Control your transmitters. Yes. That's, that's the bottom line. If you can control the output of your transmitters, you should be able to clearly see the correlation 
um, that when your transmitters are at full power and you see a corresponding rise in your receive uh, noise floor, that correlation generally clearly suggests that you've got a pin issue. Also, the odds are generally that it's going to affect one receive path and not both, unless both receive paths have a pin issue on both of the transmits uh, for MIMO. Um, because if it's an external interfere, generally, and again, depending upon polarity, there's other, you know, uh, what I'm looking for, the uh, shadows that can take place based upon the different placement of the antennas. You can sometimes see differences between the two antennas uh, when it's, uh, when I say external, but most of the time when there's differences between them, it's internal issues. Because most of the time, receive antennas will see both. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. And and we had a follow, kind of a follow up question come in. So, is the noise floor of the equipment the main specification when you choose a spectrum analyzer? Um, I would have to say yes, uh, because what you're looking for is you know, in the day it used to be a typical noise figure of a spectrum analyzer was somewhere around you know 10, 15 dB, which had to be added to that uh, the Boltzmann's constant, wherever your starting point was based on bandwidth. In today's spectrum analyzers, it's not uncommon to have noise figures of about 5 dB. Um, and this greatly increases your range and your ability to see uh, signals that are otherwise far away or lurking underneath. You know, similar to a, a civil engineer who's going to do soil samples, decide what type of structure he can you know, build on this building and what it will sustain. When you're talking about spectrum analysis, the noise figure is probably one of the key components to understanding the uh, the quality of the instrument you're using to go hunting with and being able to adjust resolution bandwidth to get it as low as possible while still maintaining a decent sweep. And I'll share with you a perspective of someone I have a lot of respect for who basically pointed out that it's not a bad thing to adjust down your resolution bandwidth and the sweep could take you as long as 20 or 30 seconds. That's okay. 20 or 30 seconds to increase the amount of visibility that you get further down is actually a good thing because you can start seeing issues that might otherwise have been gone unnoticed. All right. Um, we had another question come in uh, about one of your slides that had some PIM screen caps on it. So on those uh, slides, they show a hotter signal at the lower frequency but then ha get weaker as you move up in the frequency spectrum. However, when uh, the audience member, when they perform OCNS testing, they always see it hotter uh, at the top of the carrier and get weaker as you move down in frequency. Can you explain any possible discrepancy there? Sure. Um, what happens is with LTE, as you start thinking of the subcarriers, each one with 15 kilohertz, and you think about PIM testing where you use two discrete frequencies, and you combine those to determine where the third, fifth, you know, all the intermod products are. And what happens is, an example on a, a 10 megahertz wide LTE channel, you've got 600 subcarriers. If you do the mathematical combinations of all the pairs and where they find themselves within the spectrum, it actually produces a triangle where the peak is at, you know, the center. So depending upon whether or not your uplink is to the left, or to the right of the transmit, and also to the left or to the right of that triangle will determine which way the slope goes, whether it's sloping up or sloping down. I have a slide, uh, unfortunately I didn't include this part of this kit or this deck, that actually clearly illustrates that. But it really that slope, which direction it goes, it's not so much as important which way the slope is. If, if there's a slope there, that's not good. Um, because an LTE signal 3G, um, in, except for the scheduler giving preference to resource blocks on one side versus the other, you should never see on a min hold, max hold, a clear slope all the way across. Now, again, you can see resource blocks being assigned uh, that's giving preference to one set of spectrum versus the other because that's how some schedulers work to try to avoid collisions with their adjacent sectors and sites, but generally slopes are not a good thing, especially when you're using OCNS. All right, great answer. So 
Next question, how do you calculate aggregated interference? I'm not sure I can answer that. In terms of aggregated interference, uh, as a calculation, when I think of aggregated interference relative to uh, uh, PNs or scrambling codes or PCIs from LTE, I'm going to be looking at a ID scanner, PN scanner, or scrambling code scanner so I can determine how many sectors are trying to serve me. Uh, and if I see too many of them, that's interference. I think of that as an aggregated interferer uh, because they're all coming from the same spectrum. Odds are from my own network. And if this is where people congregate, that aggregation is not a benefit. In the early days of CDMA 2000, when you can be in a soft handoff with six sectors at the same time, and all six sectors are sending you the same information, it's great. But when as soon as they went to the EVDO, only one sector serving you, now you're really trying to not have a lot of overlap because it's no longer beneficial. All right, and we have uh, time for a few more questions here. So next one up. How can you tell if the antenna itself has PIM or if it's an external source to the antenna? The best way to determine if an antenna has PIM um, is to test on the ground. Uh, actually place it on a sawhorse, plastic preferably, and point it straight up in the air. Um, use either a PIM tester or if you have a, a, a transmitter that can excite it and while you're looking at the receive, uh, knowing that there's nothing in front of it, is probably the best way to actually test the antenna itself. Now, if the PIM is an issue of where it's mounted, now you have to look physically to see, is there anything metal in front of it? Sometimes the bracket will allow you to otherwise tilt it where it points more up into the air uh, without taking it down and see if that resolves the problem. If it does, it's not the antenna, it's what the antenna is pointing at. So that would be probably my answer. All right. Can you briefly discuss various spectrum analyzers out there? Um, there's a wide variety. There's Swiftune and there's FFT. Um, but there's also now with the introduction of RF on fiber, uh, there's now you can look at spectrum on a piece of fiber. Uh, there's a lot of uh, well-respected uh, vendors out there that have been doing spectrum analysis for a long time. Viavi happens to be in a very unique position. Um, where our spectrum analyzer has both swept tuned as well as FFT settings, as well as a SIPRI interface. And our noise figure of uh, approximately you know, 5 dB is actually extremely impressive within the industry. So uh, there's a lot of good ones out there, uh, but when you say right now, um, I'm having a lot of fun because uh, of the unique uh, advantages and all the visibility that I can achieve through one test instrument. All right, and looks like we have time for one more question. And um, uh, Brad, you touched on this briefly in your last one. So uh, we had someone actually ask, what VIAVI products and test equipment do you recommend for identification and interference? And can you provide documentation on these products? I would have to say my single best uh, offering would be the JD785B. Um, and yes, we'd be more than glad to provide you uh, details on all the features and uh, functions that it's, uh, and performance that it offers. Um, but it is effectively the, uh, in my 30 years of test engineering, I pretty much have to say that it's the best piece of test equipment I've ever used, simply because to me, it becomes the judge, jury, and executioner. If somebody suggests that there's an RF problem, I have every means at my disposal from one instrument to confirm or deny that allegation. So again, JD785B is probably my uh, top choice, especially because it has the option for a 10 dBm uh, CW source, which is oftentimes extremely useful at verifying that you're looking at the correct container on a SIPRI interface. All right, thank you. So that's about all the time we have today. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. How to efficiently detect, identify, and locate RF interference to increase RAN capacity and data throughputs, presented by Viavi. Again, our presenter was Brad Getzelman, Wireless Applications Test Engineer at Viavi. Thank you, Brad. Thank you.